first of all, I would like to say thank you all so much for um, attending this webinar. And I, I feel grateful to be invited to share some thoughts with you guys. Hopefully, you are going to find this interesting. Right. So, um, just one minute. So, today, just one minute. Just one. So, today, I want to first of all introduce myself. I know that uh, you guys have heard a little thing about me. I would like this session to be interactive. So, I'm going to start by saying that my name is Emmanuel Obodo. So as you can see from my um, qualification, you will see that I graduated in Nigeria. So I did my BSc in Nigeria, actually Imo State University. Uh, then I did my MSc at University of Chester. Following that, I did, completed my PhD at the same University of Chester. I'm currently HCPC registered and also a fellow member of Institution of Biomedical Science. Okay, that's IBMS, okay? Um, so I have extensive experience when it comes to blood transfusion. I've been opportunity, of course, to work in Nigeria and of course work here. And currently I'm a lecturer in one of the um, UK universities. So we are going to look into the blood transfusion services. Then the idea is to try to see how we can explore the challenges and advances of this aspect of pathology laboratory because i believe that at this point we all know that pathology laboratory is a big word biomedical science or like you call it in nigeria medical laboratory science or scientists you know in pathology lab is a big word so this is just one arm of that pathology laboratory so we're going to look at a lot of things so the outline of what we are going to be looking at, and please, before I continue, can I say feel free to ask questions where possible, and I'm happy to um, answer the question. If I don't know it, I'll tell you guys on the don't worry. So the outline we're going to look at, first of all, what exactly is blood transfusion services? Um, then we, from there, we're going to look at blood and yeast products. And then we can talk about the challenges in blood transfusion and look at the advancement in blood transfusion services and of course look at the blood standard because at the end why i put this one at the end is because if, if there is no standard in the laboratory when it comes to blood transfusion or blood transfusion services that can impose more challenge in addition to the challenges that is already facing okay so that's why there's a need to ensure there's a standard so i hope that by the end of this session or this presentation you should be able to explain blood transfusion services, uh, explain challenges in blood transfusion, uh, advancement in blood transfusion. And now let's look at the background. So when we talk about blood transfusion, so I might be asking some questions as we progress. Please, you are not, you don't have to if you think you don't want to answer, but if you could pop in your answers or maybe indicate and I'm sure they'll give you access to give me the answer, that would really be great. That will help me to actually know, you know, what and what that I may need to add to my presentation. So when we talk about blood transfusion, it's also big. There's a lot of things that goes on in blood bank. And like the name sound, blood. So blood, as it may be, we already know there's what to call a whole blood. Okay? So if we say blood transfusion, what we are then looking at is what exactly are we transfusing? I know that when we are, when I was in Nigeria, uh, we transfuse whole blood. That is not what we do here in the United Kingdom. So we transfuse blood based on the component of that blood, okay, which we are going to look at in detail. And of course, in transfusing that, it then means that there are a lot of conditions or some certain kind of condition that can require us to be able to transfer some certain kind of blood product. And it might also interest you to know that we've been able to, of course, like when we talk about something like anti-D, we I think you guys call it Rogan in Nigeria, okay? So when we talk about something like that, these are commercially prepared medicine. So, you know, there's been a technology that mimic what that happened naturally to be able to um, protect someone in a case of maybe um, blood transfusion or implantation, okay? Now, blood transfusion generally talks about introducing 
antigens or maybe introducing antibodies as the case may be in any form into a system of someone that requires it okay now i will explain that more then that leads to what i was trying to say about blood products so we have is blood products so in blood transfusion i'm going to be presenting today i want you to look beyond transfusing a whole blood when you transfuse a whole blood you are transfusing a lot of things at the same time so but here we transfuse based on products okay so we're going to look at that product and why we need to transfuse that now because of um, the possibility of errors which is one of the challenges associated with a uh, blood transfusion or blood bank so we are also going to be looking at automation so and that is the way of trying to minimize the possible um, errors that can occur due to manual testing as the case may be even though this might look like is a positive thing it also has its own challenges because then there can be a lot of things that can interfere to that. It doesn't take our job away, but it gives us a platform or opportunity to be able to monitor the automation, the analyzer, to see that whatever thing that is being that is happening, whatever thing that is being produced is as required, is according to the standard. Okay. So we are going to look at how to use that automation, even manual testing, as well to look at some testing in blood bank, okay? Of course, you guys already know in blood bank, the basic thing is blood group, okay? But there are some testing I'm going to be mentioning that, um, you know, hopefully will benefit you. Now, here in the United Kingdom, because of the possibility of the danger of this aspect of pathology laboratory, there has to be a lot of guidelines, which I believe we also have in Nigeria. But what happened here in the UK that we are very strict with this guideline. As a matter of fact, these guidelines, when, you know, to make sure that people follow it, there's always an annual report. And following the outcome of the annual report, it then helps the regulatory bodies to work out, are we making progress or is there anything that may need changes? So this is how new policies, many of them I'm going to mention today, you know, comes up. Now, one of those guidelines are the ones that, you know, um, is being given by what we call MHROA. Basically, it means Medicine Health Care Regulatory Agency in the United Kingdom, okay? So, they regulate for blood and yeast product and, of course, medicinal product as well. Now, there's also what we call UCAS. UCAS is like uh, when you talk about, um, how do you guys call it again? I think... Um, Medical Laboratory Science Council of Nigeria, something like that, okay? So that, this is UCAS, which is United Kingdom Accreditation Services, okay? So that is what it stands for. Now, what it means that this regulatory body, when you talk about UCAS, they look at all the whole pathology laboratory, okay? To make sure that whatever activity that is going there reflect IOSO laboratory, okay? Now, and these are just, so they make policies to make sure that the standards are maintained. Now, I think this heading now talks about blood transfusion laboratory services. Now, this is where I'm going to try to talk to us what that really happened here. So, one of the things that we know in the pathology laboratory, first of all, can I just say something? I know we do it in Nigeria, but I can't remember how much that is well separated. So, here we have, of course, specimen reception okay is someone who work as a specimen reception does not necessarily have to be a biomedical scientist but biomedical scientists can assist them can help them so i say that because you will notice that in specimen reception they are the one that receive the specimen but when it comes to blood transfusion here we want to receive our sample ourselves so we have a different kind of policy when it comes to sample acceptance so we call it uh, maybe the criteria of accepting the sample. So for I'm going to give us example, just explain this and make sure I don't come back to it. Is the fact that here in the UK we have what we call five identifiers or maybe three identifiers. So for something like hematology or microbiology or other department, you could have maybe two, three identifiers might be okay. For example, my name is Emmanuel Obodo. If you could get my name correctly, and get maybe my hospital number or what we call NHS number correctly, maybe my date of birth correctly, that sample is likely to be accepted. But when it comes to blood bank, in fact, let me also say this, when, because my name is Emmanuel, Emmanuel could be spelled with 
starting with I, but my O started with E. So let's say somebody thought I know what Emmanuel is and start with I. In Blood Bank, we're going to reject it. So in Blood Bank, we are not just after talking about the names of the patient. We want to make sure that it is correctly you know, spelled out. For example, things like um, Stephen can be spelled as S-T-E-V-E-N. You can also still, uh, spell Stephen as S-T-E-P-H-E-N. They are all, if, whichever way it goes, you are correct. But when we look at the system, which is by the way we call laboratory information management you know, um, system. So when we look at that limbs, what happened that if the limbs spelt it as S-T-E-V-E-N and what you are writing on the container is P-H-E-N, we are going to reject it. So that's why in block bank, we want to accept our sample ourselves because in other departments, they could say, okay, it's still in anyway. Maybe it's just an error. But for us in block bank, we don't want to make that mistake. So we accept our samples ourselves, okay? And in accepting it, one of the ways we do it here is that we don't assume that we know the name of the patient. We try to be spelling it maybe E, you look at the system M, you look at, so you go that way until everything is correct before you can be able to now accept it. Now, um, then we have what to call testing. So I know that when I was in Nigeria, one of the things we do is mainly do what we call type block grouping. Okay, type blood grouping. We don't necessarily do type blood grouping here. What we do is what to call card grouping. And in doing that card grouping, can I also mention that while in Nigeria, when we do type grouping, what we are actually doing, in which we do in most cases, is just forward grouping anyway. But here as well, we try to do a reverse group, which I believe, I think some people also do that in Nigeria. But what is a little bit different, which I never had the opportunity, I'm not sure what is going on now, is the antibody screening. So sometimes in blood bank in Nigeria, what we focus mainly is, what is the blood group of this person? Maybe do a cross match for people who wants to do cross match, then issue that unit. But for us here, we know that even though that the ABO can be compatible, but maybe there can be other IgG antigens that may not be compatible um, with such recipients and that need to be investigated. In fact, let me dwell on here a little bit. There is no two blood that is 100% compatible. I know this might be challenging, but that is simple truth. You know, because when you look at two patients or two people that have the same blood group, the ABO, that when I mean AB, I mean maybe antigen A, antigen B, or no antigen, whatever, in terms of your blood group A or blood group B, the ABO may appear compatible theoretically, but someone who is blood group A, and that person is blood group A, there can be a variation of their IgG antigens. And this is what this antibody testing try to find out. When we talk about IgG, you talk about a number of, because apart from the antigen A, you see on the surface of the red blood cell in terms of blood group A, okay? Or maybe antigen B, you see on the surface of the red blood cell of blood group B. Now, we say that blood group O has no antigen. That is not actually correct because there is no blood that doesn't have any antigen. But what happened is that when we talk about ABO grouping, when we specifically talk about ABO, then you can say that blood group O does not have antigen A or antigen B. As a matter of fact, someone who is blood group O positive has antigen. The person has got D antigen. I know we call it resource antigen. So that means there is antigen. Now, but why I mentioned that a D antigen is IgG antigen. But when we talk about AB, like antigen A or antigen B, they are called IgM antigens. Of course, you can also, when it is antibody A or antibody B, it's also called uh, IgM antibodies. Okay? Now, if that is the case, when we say someone is blood group O positive, I'm using that blood group O positive because we say that blood group O does not have antigen. But the, what is correct is that it does not have antigen A and or antigen B. So that is what is called because it does have other antigen, which the obvious one is the D antigen. 
for some of you that wants to come for uh, that is applied for a job to come to UK, if you really want to make sure they avoid using the word wrestler, just tell them the antigen because you know it brings this home to us that the we are talking about is an antigen that can be found on the surface of that red blood cell, and because of that, we can say that person has that. Okay, now if that is the case, then there are other antigens which are also. IgG antigen. So D antigen is IgG antigen. That's why you can have maybe antigen K, antigen E, antigen, a lot of them, Duffy A and all of that, which I'm going to show you as we move on. I'm only trying to say that to say that to make sure for effective blood transfusion where it should be safe, we shouldn't just focus only on the forward and reverse grouping. There's also need to determine the possibility of someone having any of these IgG antibodies okay now let me summarize it this way if i am blood group o and being blood group o i don't have antigen a i don't have antigen b but i might have antigen big e okay maybe i don't have antigen k so what it means that if you blindly give me blood that is the same blood group o but that blood has antigen k but i don't have antigen k but both of us are blood group o what is going to happen then, because I don't have that K antigen, which is IgG antigen, by the way. So that IgG antigen will sensitize my system. And that can be maybe in a case of, there are different types of transfusion reaction. So this can lead to maybe what we call delayed transfusion reaction, okay? But anyway, there can be sensitization. And what it means that, because the K antigen, I don't have it, my body will then produce K antibodies. So when we do this antibody testing, if it is positive, it kind of show that this person has developed antibody of antigen that he or she does not have. And of course, if he or she has it, that means it is now auto antibody. I thought I should just mention that. Now, there's also what we call weak D and partial D, which I'm not sure what is going on, like I said, in Nigeria, but I don't remember us determining this. So what we know is positive, we can't even differentiate, we don't differentiate it, let me not say can't. Okay, but there's a need to find out whether, you know, someone's reaction you are seeing, is it that is a weak D? You know, when you say blood group A, resource or D, antigen positive. So sometimes that D antigen may not necessarily be a full-blown D antigen. It could be a partial D. Is not a full, is not in fact, it's not a D antigen because there's a different the weak antigen. Weak D antigen means it's a D antigen, but it is weakly expressed. That means the person has got the D antigen. But what happened with the partial D antigen you might see is that there is the whole protein that make up the D antigen is not complete. Let me use that one. And because it's not complete, you cannot really say that the person is D antigen now let me tell you why it's important to differentiate these two it's important to differentiate these two when you are dealing with women within childbearing age because if you see partial d and you say this person is d antigen positive and you give the person blood that is d antigen positive this person might end up developing antibody d and of course you all know it might cause problem in future pregnancy so that's why we have to differentiate the two okay now in doing that because i've already mentioned the igg antigens then we now need to have to find a way to identify this antibody so if someone has developed other antibodies that is not you know like antigen a antigen b antibody sorry antibody a uh, antibody b there are other antibodies someone can develop maybe anti-k like i've mentioned anti-e anti dufi a anti mns like anti m anti n anti f there are so many of them so if someone develop that it is important that we find out and when we find out then we can then um, be able to find a better option of blood we can give to that person now i say this thing because there are guidelines surrounding this whole thing Okay, when I come to that point, I'm going to mention it more. But there are guidelines surrounding this. That's why in the UK, there's what to call electronic issue. You know, like you say, your electronic, now nah, issuing blood. Okay, so electronic issue is what to call like computer cross match. 
which is ideally actually i would say what is common in nigeria because sometimes we say okay this person is blog group or we carry blog group or and give that person we do the same thing here but in a way in a in a way that the guideline regulated to make sure that the possible mistake is well minimized so what we do is that once you have ascertained that this is the blog group of this person we can actually give blog without necessarily doing serological cross match so we call it computer cross match and that is what we call electronic issue it is in that a uh, blind transfusion that someone can possibly develop these antibodies i'm talking about like i've mentioned about myself i don't have antibody k sorry i don't have antigen k but i'm blood group o and you give me blood group o that has antigen k in that bl in that blind transfusion what would then going to happen i would develop antibody k and next time when i come then you will see that i've developed antibody k now let me tell you why UK has done this to minimize the problem of this. They've done this because even if you develop it, we now have the possibility of detecting that. We're not going to allow that to continue. Why? Because we have a guideline that talks about um, sample validity. I don't think I have it here. But sample validity, you know, mention things like, is a guideline that say that if someone has not been transfused within the last 90 days or three months, if someone has not been transfused within the last 90 days or three months, the person blood group will be valid for seven days. But if someone has been transfused within the last 90 days, or even if the person is pregnant, because pregnancy is a form of you know, transfusion because there is implantation, meaning there is antigen that is in someone. That is a form of transfusion, okay? So if somebody has been transfused within 90 days, or the person is pregnant, the person's blood group will only be valid for 72 hours. The reason for this is that evidence has shown that these IgG antibodies can develop, okay, within 72 hours. So this is what we do. And what it then means that the sample validity I'm talking about, and let me also go a little bit further to mention, we have what we call um, um, current group, and we also have what we call historic group. Here we try to continue testing the blood group to make sure that whenever there's any change, we can be able to find out. So we have a current group, we have a historic group. Let me explain what I mean. So we don't just test someone once and say, this is the blood group of this person. We don't just do that. So we test you the first time. We then have to test you another time. Once your previous sample and the current sample say the same thing that this is the blood group of this person, then we can say that is the blood group of this person. If it is someone that is rushed quickly to the hospital and this person did the first time, and they want to take the sample because we need two samples to test and we don't want the mistake to happen. Now, the guideline that we use here to make sure that that will be the result of that patient is that two different staff will have to collect the sample, but and also it has to be done at least 10 minutes apart. What it means is that if you are a doctor or you are a nurse, so you can collect this, this patient's sample who has been rushed to the hospital, sent to the blood bag. After 10 minutes, another person will come and collect. For the, the same, from the same patient, send it to the lab. Now, when these two samples will analyze it and will get the same result, we cannot say that is a blood group of that very person. What it means that the first one you did will not become, you know, the two samples, the first one they sent will then become historic. The second one they sent will then become current. Now, let me tell you why I mentioned that. We don't issue any blood to anyone as a product is not emergency anyway but in in outside emergency we don't issue any blood without the person having both historic and a current blood so this is how we monitor that so when i say that the sample is valid for seven days or some two hours as the case may be what i'm actually saying is that if someone has been transfused after three days after some two hours we need another sample if someone has not been transfused after seven days, we need another sample. If it is a pregnant woman, after 72 hours, we also need another sample. What it means that blood group and antibody screening is one of the routine things that we do here. They, we have to continue testing that. Okay. I feel like asking a question right now. Let me see if you could tell me the answer quickly. That would be great. What do you think that can change blood group? Or maybe can blood group be changed? If the answer is yes, what do you think can change blood?
if you can pop it on the chart or indicate hopefully um, yeah please can you okay um is it joy i think joy is raising hands so yeah give yeah let her say what she think yeah go on thank you joy can i go on? one of the things that can change blood group could be medications Medication, okay. the drugs the person the, the drugs the person could be taking could make the yes that's one of the things that can change it okay that's fine sometimes, you know, go on. sometimes too when the anti steroids are not stored properly in the right temperature it could make the anti d not to react so that one is just technical error so we is the blood group has changed okay right we're talking about when there is standard so yeah medication as i agree any other suggestion okay that's fine that's good thank you so much joy so actually yeah, medication can do that in fact one other thing that medication can actually do is that uh i, I know you guys don't use automation men but here Depend on the kind of medication that the person is on, you might realize that you can't even get any result. You know, you, you can't be able to say that this person is blood group A, or you can't. You are going to get what to call discrepancy, okay? Meaning nothing is really agreeing with the blood group. Remember that here, like I've told you guys, when we're doing testing, we do, let me pick this. So when we're doing, just one minute, let me pick this up. So when we're doing this routine thing, so this is a routine test. So we do the ABO blood group. In this ABO blood grouping, we do both forward and reverse group. So we want both the forward and reverse group to agree. If they don't agree, it's a discrepancy. So we need to investigate it. And of course, we also do antibody testing. So yeah, medication can cause that. Now, and you can now see that if we now do a current group from what I've told you, if it looks like you are getting a different result, what do you do? You investigate. It is through that investigation you can now find out, oh, maybe it's a medication. Are you following? Then it can now make you to now find a better way to do that. Most times when medication affects it, is it might require a technique such as maybe a lucian technique to be able to remove that interference and that way, you know, um, the result can then come out the way it's supposed to be. But that's by the way. So medication actually can have effect on the blood group. I want you to note what I've said. I said it will have effect. It may not necessarily change the blood group of that person. Okay? Now, but one of the reasons why I asked that question is because there is other things, one, one, one main thing that is likely, in, very likely to totally, absolutely alter the blood group of someone. And that is... If you know that the blood is produced in the bone marrow, you will then know that bone marrow transplant can do that. Do you understand? So if someone has undergo bone marrow transplant, the blood group can change. Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned this is was because if you do the current group, so maybe after three years or ten years, because what the, the system will use it will always go to maintain the historic group once you've done it at least twice even if at once even if you've done the blood group once the system will always go to have a historic group but to issue blood you then need a current group now what happens that if someone come in and the current group seems like it is different from what we used to know you can investigate them from there you can find out oh this person has now has undergoed bone marrow transplant then that can explain that i hope that makes sense okay so i thought i should bring that up the reason why i'm saying this is because when we talk about antibody identification we are looking at all that things not just your abo blood group and this is where issuing blood comes since i've mentioned we issue blood either electronically or by cross match so once we notice that this person have developed an antibody we then do what we call serological cross match so if you are asked, if you are being asked a question you know in issuing blood it's either by computer cross match or by a, a serological cross match okay so computer cross match you don't necessarily do a physical cross match the only criteria is have a current group no antibody you know uh, present then you can just issue the blood but serological cross match means there is antibody you've detected then you cannot be able to um you know do the cross match and if it is compatible you can issue it and this is where phenotyping comes in so if we have other antigens that can be found on the surface of the red blood cell 
what it then means that in order to see the antigens that may be different from these two patients that is the same blood group, we then do phenotype. So when you say phenotype, you are look phenotyping talks about you know detecting or determining the IgG antigens that are possibly present on the surface of red blood cell of a patient. So that's what uh, phenotyping does. And then there's also what we call Klahawas, okay? In this Klahawas, it's kind of trying to measure, you know, um, the presence of maybe photo cells in the mom. You know, when there's, when you are suspecting a kind of internal bleeding, or as the case may be, of course, you know, when you talk about your, uh, I'm not sure, you know, when you talk about your uh, fetus uh, maternal hemorrhage, okay? Where maybe a woman is the antigen negative and the baby is the antigen positive, which can cause a, sens a sensitization, then we cannot do the cloud. I think with this, I've given us the overview of what that goes on in blood bank transfusion. Now, of course, we receive the blood, we also store the blood, and hopefully you know the storage temperature of the red blood cell. So like, I, what I want us to know here, please, before we move on, is that we have different components, and I'll come to that. So each of these components, they can be stored differently. And when I get to that point, we can deliberate on it more. Okay, so still on that, we have what we call neonatal transfusion. So there's a different, we have a different guideline for transfusing a baby or neonatal patient compared with that of the adult. And of course, we have what we call issuing emergency blood product. So in the case of emergency, we have a protocol. Remember what I said, if it's not emergency, for us to issue blood, we need a current group. And from what I've said, if we need a current group, that means there has to be a historic group, okay? Now, but in a case of emergency, if there is no current group, if there is no historic group, we cannot say we cannot issue blood because it's an emergency. So what we do, we now activate a protocol, which um, if I go into it, now, it except if it come off like a question, then I'm happy to deal with that more. But there's a protocol on how to go about this as well. Now, we have medicinal products, and that's why you look at um, anti-D, you know, uh, autoplex and so on, okay? Then we look at automation, which is what we used for testing. And of course, if we are going to do all of this and maintain standard, there's a need to ensure that there's an effective training because if there's no effective training, it can have effect. And that effective training can then lead to what we call competence. So somebody needs to be competent to be able to work in broadband. I think I've given you overview. Now, um, just to... Do you guys, does anyone have any questions before I continue? Because I want to play a video now, so I just want to see if you have any question. Just a brief question, something before I continue. Any question? No? Okay. Yeah, good. All right. If there is no question, can I just play this video? So this video hopefully will show you. I try to get a short, you know, second video just to make sure you see, you know, um, how the blood group and antibodies, mainly blood group is done here. So this card you are seeing, is the card group I mean. So if you remember your anti sera you use in Nigeria, you can see the color here at the center. Anyway, let me talk to you. very good uh, can anyone if you are comfortable and you want to tell me what you what you thought this video is trying to communicate can you indicate that just tell me but there are a few things that i really want to highlight yeah can i okay nobody that's fine if there's nobody can i just mention that if you look at that you're going to see there's a card so how this automation work? Of course, there's going to be reagent inside the analyzer first. So what and what should be in that reagent? Now, remember that when you are doing your blood group, 
you are using antisera like you like it's being used in Nigeria. So use antisera and then test the patient blood group. But now you have a card that is already this antisera is already embedded in this card. Okay, whether it is antisera A, antisera B, D. Of course, there's also a negative control where there shouldn't be anything to show us whether the result is valid or not. Now, the way the card is, I don't know how you can picture this. So you have antisera A embedded, antisera B embedded, then you have anti D embedded. The fourth column will be just negative. It's a gel, but there's nothing there. So that should come up negative. Now, there's also another side of the card, which will now have A, and another one will have B. That A is talking about the um, antigen A, and B talks about antigen B. Now, let me tell you how it works. So we use commercially prepared A cells and commercially prepared B cells, and this will be inside the analyzer. So we have commercially prepared A cell, commercially prepared B cells. Now, we now load the gel out, which now have the antisera, okay? Then, what we're going to do, we now put the pressure sample. So this pressure sample, before we put it, we'll spin it down, we'll centrifuge it so that there can be a separation between the red cells and the plasma. What the analyzer is going to do is this. The analyzer will then pick the card. I'm sure you guys saw when it picked the card. When it picked the card, it will puncture the cards. So what it's going to do, it's going to do a dilution. So it's going to miss, it will go, the probe will go inside and pick red cells and kind of dilute it. Okay, let's say, let me make it easier for you guys, like normal salad, but we'll call it diluent, okay? So it can dilute with the diluent, and once it dilutes it, then it will carry the red cells and put in antisera A, which is embedded in a gel, and B, and D, and of course the control. Does that make sense? Now, once it has done that, that will test for forward grouping. That is what we do in Nigeria when we do the tight grouping. Now, this reverse grouping, that which we can also do by tight grouping as well, what is now going to happen is to now, because this testing of forward grouping use the patient red cell, we are now going to do another one that will use the patient plasma, like you're also doing on the tie in Nigeria. So, but we now use a known A cell, a known B cell, no longer the patient cell. So the analyzer will pipette that A cell and put on the um, A well, and prepare this cell and put on the B well, then prepare the patient plasma and add on both of them. So that is how it works. It then incubates it. If you look at that, there was a centrifuge. Then after the incubation, it will centrifuge it. Now from the centrifugation, once that is done, it will pick it and read it. Okay. So once it read it through the uh, scanning of the barcode and scanning, you know, the result what it can based on what is transparent or what is not transparent. So once it read it, it can now be able to tablet what that result is. If you work towards the end, which is actually what I really want to mention, towards the end of that video, you are going to see there was a connection. I don't know if you saw that wire, or maybe that kind of um, networking between the, the system, the computer, which is laboratory information management system, and the analyzer itself. So that is called an interface. Okay? So this interface means that the analyzer has processed it. Once it processes it, okay, then of course, if a biomedical scientist look at it and you're happy with it, once you accept the result, that interface between the analyzer and the limbs will now transfer that result to the analyzer. So, oh, sorry, to the, um, the limbs. So when you now go to your computer and check it, you can now see that result. So that's what happens. So with that, it can do both the forward and reverse grouping, and two of them has to agree, okay? So now, the another side of the test, which is IgG antibody screening, which I didn't show, I didn't have the video here, but let me explain it to you. The same principle, but instead of using ABO gel card, it's going to use what to call IgG card, because we are measuring IgG antibodies, okay? Now, what we are going to use is a known commercially prepared, you know, cells. So we can have cell one, cell two, cell three, as the case may be. So this non-commercially prepared cells will not contain different antigens. I will show you some examples. Now, let me give you this. Now, let's say cell one might have antigen D, antigen K, antigen E, antigen Dufi A, and cell two will have different antigens, meaning there can be, there is different antigens on each of these very cells. What this analyzer is going to do is again puncture the uh, IgG card. 
pick if it is a lighter that uses cell one and cell two, it will puncture it in two places. Cell one will go on the first place, the cell two will go on the second place. Now, remember, these cells have different antigens. Then it will now use the patient plasma and put on each of them. Again, incubate it, then centrifuge it and check it. If it is positive, it means that the person has got antibody of any of the antigens that is on those cells, on any of the cells, either both or either. So once you find that out, you don't know whether it is, because if there are more than one cell, one, one antigen is there, it means that that, anti, that result you are seeing, you don't know the particular antibody that that patient is reacting to the antigen to it. For example, if you have antigen K, antigen E, antigen Dufi A, and it is positive, so the person may be having anti Dufi A or anti K or anti E. You don't know the one. So what you are now going to do is to do what we call antigram or antibody panel. That will then help you to identify the antibody. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Now, sorry, I was gonna ask us something. I think I've already said it already. Can someone tell me the blood product? If you have confidence to tell me the blood product and what you know, why we should transfuse them, that would be that would be great. You can put it on a chart, or you can add the, you know you can indicate. And um, if you can actually indicate, I will appreciate that more. But if not, you can put it on a chart. Uh, what are the blood product, and when do we give it? Because I've told you guys that we should not really transfuse a whole blood. No, that is not really good practice. We should be transfusing blood components. So, what are the components of blood and when do we, why do we, or when do we supposed to issue such unit or at which condition is any of the unit required? I think there's some information on the chat. Someone said fresh person plasma. Yeah. And Another person is there, platelet rich plasma, red yeah. cells. Yeah. What is that? Cryo precipitate. Correct. Okay, that's fine. I've got more than enough of what I want. So these are the products. So that is actually correct. All of them are correct. So if we look at the blood component, all you need to think in terms of your normal centrifuge. If you centrifuge blood, what do you see? You see red cells. You see the buffy coat. Now, the buffy coat, you can get maybe the white cells in underneath a little and the platelet a little bit up, then you cannot get the plasma, okay? Now, these are the components, okay? Now, but there's something I want to ask. Since you have mentioned FFP and cryo, is there any difference between FFP and cryo? Because both of them are plasma. You can also pop it on a chart. Because two of them, they are plasma. So, is there any difference? Yeah? Okay. That's fine. I'm going to explain that. But if you, you already know why we give red cells, okay? In a case of generally the hospital, whatever condition that causes suspected anemia. So we do that. So platelet, of course, if there's thrombocytopenia, then we do that. Any condition that may lead to that. Now, where it can be a little bit challenging is these two, FFP and cryo. Okay? So now, let's take it one after the other. So red cells I've mentioned, and um, you know when to give it. Then plasma, this plasma is generic. So this plasma can be fresh frozen plasma or it can be cryoprecipitate, okay? Now, when we say fresh frozen plasma is a plasma, when we say cryoprecipitate is a plasma, but the difference is what they contain. Now, let me say this. Remember that most of the proteins, I think the, one of the common questions, even when I was in Imo I think one of the common questions is the difference between serum and plasma. I think Nigeria likes to ask that question a lot. So uh, we used to say that the plasma is maybe, um, maybe, should I say, liquid part of the blood, maybe in the presence of uh, anticoagulant, which is correct, okay? The other one, absence of anticoagulant, which is also correct. So the way I would like you to look at it is this in a more, maybe more refined scientific way, or is that? Think about a sample you collect on a plane tool and a sample you collect on any anticoagulated bottles. What do you think will happen? If you mix them properly, it doesn't matter what happens, the one on the plane tube is going to clot. But the one on that that contains anticoagulant is not going to clot. What it means is that if you spin, if you centrifuge the one of the plane tube down, you are still going to get a liquid part of the blood. But on this occasion, it's not serum. When you centrifuge the other one, you're also going to get a liquid part of the blood, but it's not called plasma. Now, the difference now is the fact that this one you call um, serum, 
a lot of protein has been used up. Because if you say that it's, it has clotted, that clot means that a lot of clotted factors have been activated. So many proteins have been used up to be able to clot the sample. And that is why you are likely to find more proteins in plasma than you would find in serum. Okay? Now, I mentioned this because of what I want to explain. In plasma, it contains clotted factors. That's why I mentioned that. Okay? So what it means that when we suspect in a case of where coagulopathies, where there's abnormal clotting, you know, fat, maybe factor deficiency, or as the case may be, once you suspect there's a clotting issues here, okay, the person might be deficient of any of the clotting factors, you can give plasma FFP to enrich, to augment whatever thing that is going on there. And that is also why when somebody is in a case of major hemorrhage, somebody is bleeding, you know, the person's system is, you know, the clotting factors can be used up as well. And then the plasma can also be given to also to replenish that a bit. And of course, to balance um, the, um, the hemostasis of the percentage of the red cells and the plasma. So the plasma itself content is high, is rich with clotting factors. That's all I'm trying to say there. Now, but the current precipitate is also a plasma. But now this one is rich in fibrinogen. Remember, fibrinogen is still a clotting factor. Don't forget that, okay? Now, but it is concentrated in cryoprecipitate. You have high fibrinogen. So once we notice that someone is having high, uh, sorry, low fibrinogen, we can give the person cryoprecipitate. I think that is it. Then we'll have white cells and have platelets. And then, of course, you know, I mentioned things like clotting factors, like I'm trying to explain. Now, in these clotting factors as well, let me dwell here a little bit. Just explain something. It's not just because someone is bleeding. Sorry, um, before I continue, uh, Obina, do I, how many minutes do I still have? Because it seems like I still have a lot to say. Let me not be carrying on the talking and forget. I still have many slides to go through. How many minutes do I have? Okay, I think you have like 50 more minutes. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I should have time to do that. Okay, let me continue. So now, one of the reasons why I mentioned the clotting factors here is very, very vital. It's vital because when you talk about the cryoprecipitate or plasma, like I've mentioned, if somebody is bleeding, I've explained that, or factor deficiency, I've explained that. But what, when we say coagulopathies, let me ask that question. What exactly are we talking about? If someone can pop it on a chart or just tell me over, I just want to make sure before I carry on saying what I want to say. What is actually, what's the meaning of coagulopathies? Any answer? Okay, yeah, uh, Miriam, thank you, go on. Uh, I'll be like, can you give her, can you allow her to talk, please? I think Miriam, Jamila, something like that. Can you unmute her, please? Obina, are you there? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, you can go, Miriam. Go on. I think you've been unmuted. Okay, it's usually as a result of maybe an excessive, you know, clotting going on in the body. So, so say that again. There's something that I think you, I think you said something wrong, but I didn't quite get it. Usually, of course, when there is an excessive bleeding, mm -hmm. or in the something. body, or clotting, or clotting in the body. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. So when we say coag from the word coagulation, so we are looking at clotting cascade pathways, which can be either intrinsic, extrinsic, or common pathways. Okay. Now, what it means then, I may not have this session will not allow me to explain all of them. I'm just gonna tell you guys overview. So what it then means is that there's a possibility that someone could have, like what Mary I'm trying to say, someone could have a factor deficiency. Remember that each of these factors are required to be able to maintain effective or ensure effective um, um, hemostasis, if I'm to use that word, okay? Effective activation of the clotting cascade, okay? Now, what it means that if one of the factors is deficient, 
what is then going to happen? The person is likely to bleed. For example, when you say something like hemophilia, the person has a tendency to bleed. Why? Because the person can be deficiency with either factor 8 or factor 9. Okay? So when you say hemophilia A, the person has deficiency of factor 8, hemophilia uh, B, factor 9 deficiency. So that will make the person to bleed. Now, but that is one way. One of the reasons why I asked this question was because of the people that has a tendency to form a clot. Their system has a tendency to form a clot. So, you know, the, blood, the clotting casket is supposed to be activated in a case of abnormality where there's a bleeding or as the case may be. Something needs to cause the activation of the clotting casket. But if for any reason clotting casket suddenly just be activated and the person starts forming clot, that can be a problem. I would have loved to ask questions, but because of our time, I'm going to explain it. So the problem of that internal clot means the passage of the blood vessels could be blocked. And of course, that could lead to stroke, paralysis, or anything like that, okay? And this is actually somehow what, um, let me explain it, D-dama measures. So when you say D-dama, D-dama is not necessarily, somehow, depending on how you look at it, D-dama is not necessarily measuring um, clotting casket. I'm to use that word, okay? What DDMA is measuring is a, a we call it FDP, that's fibrin degraded product. So for clot to form means that fibrinogen has to be converted to fibrin for clot to form. So now what it means that when clot is formed, that means that the fibrin formation. So when that fibrin, you know, start degrading and start floating in the system, which is now FDP, fibrin degraded product, that is actually what DDMA measures. And this is why DDMA can be high in the case of someone who have deep vent thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or something like, let me use a common one, like something like rheumatoid arthritis. Now, because of the condition of this, or what, we, what you call it, a DIC, okay? Uh, uh, you know, that intravascular. Yeah, yeah. intravascular. Yeah, so once you have that, that could also, that, what is that? that condition make the person system to kind of form clot. There's also what we call TTP, okay? So this TTP also means that the blood vessel, there can be clot forming in the blood vessel. So these are different coagulopathies. I'm trying to explain something here. So because of this possibility of this person forming clot, what's the danger? Stroke, paralysis, death, as the case may be, cardiac, you know, malfunction and all of that. Because of that, the doctors are going to prescribe anticoagulants. That's actually why I explain all of this. Okay, so the doctor will then prescribe anticoagulants so that the person can now have anticoagulant either orally or intravascular, depending on what the person wants to target. So this anticoagulant can then help to prevent this abnormal clotting. He says now, but why that is solving a problem is creating another problem because if you put anti if someone is taking anti gland, there's a possibility that if it is not effectively monitored, the person's system might be watery and the person might bleed to death, depending on you know. So sometimes you guys will go for interview and they say a patient is bleeding from the nose, rush into the air, he's bleeding from the nose, from the mouth. These are the what they are expecting from you, okay. So the person would, the, the doctor would then prescribe uh, this oral anticoagulant or intravascular anticoagulant, and that would then be monitored. Okay. So and that is where this clotting factor thing I'm going to explain comes in. So because with this, once that is now uh, prescribed, what it means is that it's going to attack the clotting factors, preventing it from happening. Okay, so one that is attacked. By the way, let me also say this in person. Remember that your body has a natural anticoagulant. But I don't think I have time to explain. But your body has a natural anticoagulant. So if you start, if someone starts bleeding, okay, the body will start to activate clotting casket. Once that condition is controlled, the body will then start releasing its natural anticoagulant. Okay, like when you say something like anti These are natural anticoagulant. Protein C, protein S, these are natural anticoagulants. Now, but in a coagulopathy, this natural anticoagulant can come up, you know, in a manner that they shouldn't come up. And of course, it will make the person system as well to be watered. But anyway, I'm trying to say that this anti oral anticoagulant or intravascular anticoagulant is prescribed to not be able to inhibit the clotting casket. So sometimes what they do is to attack a particular site of the casket or, or maybe attack what they depend on. For example, things like vitamin K, like things like warfarin will attack 
that vitamin K. And that is required for extrinsic pathway to be effective. Now, another aspect of the blood product, which is, you know, commercially prepared as well, like I've mentioned, is, is what we call anti D prophylaxis. So for some of you who are coming for interview in the UK, please don't say Rogan, just say anti D prophylaxis. If that is the answer, whatever thing you have been asked, this is what we want to hear. And this is where we give a woman who is pregnant, who is antigen D negative, give this then the body kind of mimic as though is the antigen positive but it's not okay now that um another medicinal product is what we call prothrombin complex concentration we call it ultraplex so this ultraplex is now what can be used if we think you know what this anticoagulant we've given to this patient is now going to cause a problem if somebody is on anticoagulant you can't take the person to surgery you can't do that because the person is going to bleed so because of that, the doctor, in order to reverse that anticoagulant, can then prescribe for a uh, prothrombin complex. I think um, that's just a few things I want to say. That. This high volume, high quality blood testing machine is unique to the blood banking world. Fully automated, it helps ensure the safety of the blood supply by testing donor samples for things like hepatitis B, C, and HIV. In eight hours, it runs five different blood tests on 1,000 donations without human intervention. Between each of these tests, it sterilizes every single probe in a wash solution. Another machine determines the blood type, of which there are eight. They scan the donor's collection bag and document what products they will produce from the blood. Then they weigh it. Overnight, gravity causes the blood to separate into its three components. So a worker remixes it, preparing it for machine separation. the blood in the bags for the other components into what's called a liner. She makes sure the liners are balanced and will put a rubber weight inside when she needs to. Balancing the liners keeps the centrifuge machine spinning properly at 4,000 RPM as it separates the blood into layers. then hooks up the unit of separated blood to an automated extractor and once again matches the unit with the donor. The extractor fills a bag with just red blood cells. As the machine fills the bag, it leaves behind a mixture of blood and platelets in the original container. As it extracts these red blood cells and leaves behind a portion of blood and platelets, it also fills another container with pure plasma. An incubator keeps the processed platelets well mixed. They only have five days to use these platelets. However, they freeze plasma and can use it for 12 months. Finally, they filter out the white blood cells from the red blood cells using what's called a leuco reduction filter. Right, um, because of our time, and I'll ask you something. What that analyzer uh, was trying to show was the suppression technique. So when, we, when someone donates blood, here is a whole blood. So we now have a technique where we can be able to separate that blood into different components. That is what it's trying to um, show you there, okay? If you have any question you can ask me later now there are different um, uh, blood bank um, services donor centers transportation so someone needs to transport that and of course the testing manufacturing so the manufacturing talks about manufacturing whether it is red cells or ffp or cryo as the case may be and of course there's a department that look at the quality control monitoring and then of course bacteria screening as well 
and hospital services are the ones that are not in that kind of if the hospitals need any blood product they want to request for blood or something like that you know to be sent to them they will then phone the hospital services to be able to do that for them now there's also a reference you know laboratory so in most cases here in the uk there are some tests that local hospital may not be able to do in blood bank then we cannot refer it to the reference laboratory to be able to um, do that but i don't think that should really be a problem. Now, let's look at the challenges associated with this whole thing. One of the reasons why I lay all this background to see how complex this can be. And in the problem with blood bank is that once there's any little mistake, that can affect the overall thing. It can affect, you know, it. So, for example, there's a problem with the blood demand and discrepancy. So, there, there, you know, people continue to demand blood and sometimes here we run shortage of, you know, um, stock or maybe you want a certain kind of blood product and they say they don't have it and then we try to improvise, you know, another method or, as the case may be. Now, a discrepancy is also the situation whereby the possibility where um, you can have uh, blood where due to that stock shortage, you cannot give another blood, even though theoretically you know that can be compatible. Let me give you an example. Let's say in a situation whereby someone is D antigen negative, but because of shortage of blood, as the case may be, you give D antigen positive. You know, technically it's not, it's a discrepancy, but anyway, because that we know that should be okay. That's why we give it. That's what that is talking about. Now, of course, the storage of the blood, you know, apart from maybe something like plasma or, or cryo that can really last for a very long time, the rest have a short, you know, shelf life. And that also is a huge challenge. Now, another challenge is the fact that there's a possibility of blood transmission, 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 sorry, transmissible uh, infections. So, because when someone donates blood, especially here in the UK, sometimes the person have donated blood and the person have gone back home. Um, the good thing that we have a technology that track everything. Even the person who have donated blood, we know where his blood is up to. If I donate blood now, I will know, okay, my blood is not in this hospital. Okay, it has not undergone suppression. It has undergone testing. It has not been... The, I will even get information of the patient that has the sample now, you know, took the blood, okay? So that is how, you know, it is. But what if now, at any point, we find out that there's a possibility of infection so that we can be able to track it. But in most cases, if this is not tracked on time, a patient must have had either of the, uh, any of this uh, blood product or maybe all of the blood product. So it's still a challenge, okay? Now, of course, determining the blood typing sometimes can be a challenge because even though someone needs to be competent, but where there is any slightly mistake, which could be from the analyzer as the case may be, or lack of oversight as the case may be, that could also affect it, okay? So every, most of the problem in blood bank has to do with it the possibility of issuing an incompatible unit to a patient or someone developing infection or developing what the person shouldn't have had if not that the person has been transfused. Then another thing is cross-matching and this of course can also be demanding as the case may be. Then you talk about human resources, of course, here in the NHS here, you know, we we'll always short staff as the case may be. So it's still a challenge to us. And that challenge has to do with the uh, suitable infrastructure, which may not really be common here, but yeah, maybe back home could be in a common problem, you know, looking at, you know, the structure of the way things should be done. In fact, if you donate blood here, the way you are being treated, it looks like you should be coming every time to donate blood here, yeah? okay? So I think they've got a good uh, structure. Now, resources constraint and funding. Now, there's a lot of things, small research that could be, that can actually help blood bank. But of course, if the resources are constrained and there's no funding, some of this research may be delayed in trying to improve um, the services of the blood bank. So these are the challenges that can be associated uh, with a blood bank. And of course, lack of education or effective education and training could also be a problem. Now, one of the reasons why I made most of made a point of those things that I said beginning because of before this one that I was I wanted to make sure that this presentation benefit us more in terms of seeing how far this part of the world has gone. And then we can now start looking at even much more we could do here, okay? And then reflect what we are doing back home. And my idea is that hopefully after this we can be able to adjust our services you know where possible to see that what we're doing is up to standard so there's automation and technology which is the advancement which of course we also have in nigeria i'm not sure can i ask a question is there anyone here that you use automation to do your blog group in nigeria or wherever you go anybody okay all right okay good 
Any other person? Right. Does anyone here do antibody panel or antibody screening in your lab? IgG antibody screening, antibody panel. Anybody? No, we don't. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Good. All right. Anyway, automation and technology is we we use it now. Of course, we also have a way of doing a kind of pathogen reduction technologies. Okay, so there's a way you know because of the possibility that someone has donated blood. And maybe, you know what you guys call incubation period. Maybe this infection has not really, or this disease or whatever, has not really showed up in the person's system. That can be a mistake. But we have a technology, you know, uh, which we can actually use to be able to um, detect that on time. And of course, that cannot help to reduce the possibility of that very uh, pathogen contamination. Okay. Now, this telemedicine and remote blood donation, you know, is where technology can actually be used for any of this blood bank or blood donation now global collaboration of course i'm not sure how it will back home but here there's a number of collaboration between uk us and europe and all of the australia and all this kind of so that collaboration makes them what is obtainable here is likely to be obtainable in any of this part of the world that way standard can be maintained can i even say something here Remember that when we talk about ISO laboratory, we are looking at international, okay? So if it is international, where possible, you know, each of the countries that are part of the ISO laboratory, they should actually pick up what these other people are doing across because it's a central uh, way of passing information on how something can be done. Then that should then be delivered to each of these countries. The whole idea of ISO laboratory, there shouldn't really be any difference between Nigeria and UK. If that or any part of the world, if that can be implemented because it's a central place and which I believe a medical laboratory science council of Nigeria. I want to believe they are they are part of IOC laboratory. I think I'm correct. If I'm not, just someone should just let me know. Now we use in that uh, reduction of the pathogen, we can do what we call nucleic acid testing. This will help us to be able to be able to detect that pathogen on time, even if it is still at the east incubation period, as the case may be, before uh, whatever can be able to happen. Now there's what we call efferesis technology. Now I'm going to explain this. This when I say efferesis, who can Tell me what it is because this is important that it is explained. Do you know what is efferesis? Let's say efferesis platelet or efferesis plasma, whatever. Do you know what it is? Okay, maybe because of our time, I'm just gonna say so. When you, when somebody donate blood, so I'm O positive. So if you get my my platelet A positive, of course you know when you centrifuge your blood, your whole blood in a container, red cells are big, plasma is big. But that goofy coat is where you can now start talking about your white cells and platelets. What I'm trying to say that platelets is not that much when you do that suppression. So you are likely to have one donor with red cells, one donor with plasma, but it might be difficult to have one donor with platelets. Okay? Because of the amount of what you might see there. Therefore, when you put, when you get platelets from this patient, O positive platelets here, O positive platelets here, O positive platelets here, you put them together, it's called pool platelets. That means it's a platelet that you put together. Now, the technology of making sure that from one donor, you get as many platelets as you want, as many, uh, the amount of the platelet we want from one donor. That is called then efferesis platelet. So efferesis platelet, we talk about, you know, um, that platelet is from one donor, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. So there can be full platelet or efferesis platelet. Now, radio frequency identification is also another technology where we can be able to monitor you know what is actually going on in terms of uh, maybe the blood band okay the unit of the blood that someone has been issued or as a case maybe without necessarily being there physically with this technology we can be able to monitor that and of course with this technology we can also be able to intercept whatever we want that to stop okay if we detect any problem now let me tell you why this technology is important here in the uk there's what to call recall and i believe nigeria should also do the same thing so recall is that you know remember from one blood well, from one blood donation, we can have red cells, we can have FFP, we can have cryo, we can have platelets, where possible, not in all cases, we may have white cells, okay? Now, but let's stick with this four. So with this four, what it means that, you know, um, at some point, we may find that there's something wrong with the blood product. So we now need to recall it. By the time we want to recall it, 
we may find out that the, someone has already been transferred with the red blood cell or someone has already been transferred with the platelet. So what we might record is the plasma or everything has already been transferred. But I'm trying to say that to make sure that we detect that and trap it on time, we can use this technology, okay? So this technology helps us to be able to look at that. Now, there's also what we call 3G printing of organ and blood vessels. I think this is still a new thing. And it has come across a lot of a number of things. Okay, so here we now want to kind of uh, produce a kind of artificial blood vessels in terms of blood donation. So that is what this is all about. Okay, now still in the advancement, then we talk about smart blood bag and sensor. So there are blood bags that they are very smart. They have a sensor. Okay, they can be able to detect anything that shouldn't really be there, as the case may be. Then it can sensor it and give you the alert so that you can be able to respond accordingly. Then we have mass spectrometry for blood typing. So this can also help in the blood typing. When I mean blood typing, like determining the blood group or maybe an antibody screening as well. Okay. Now, and you look at hemovigilance system. This hemovigilance system from the world, I'm not sure. Let me ask the question. Who knows what hemovigilance means on this in, when they talk about blood bank? I don't just want to say it. Uh, does anyone know? If you know, you can pop it on a chat or if you want to say something. You can say. Anyone? I think it's monitoring uh, the process from blood collection to where it's transfused to see if there is any violation. Absolutely, absolutely. There are no removal. They are not adding anything. I'm not you know, removing anything from your answer. That is actually what it means. So now, because I use the word system because there's a system of going about it. This will help us to track any problem we are possible you know that way we can take up a report you know of if there's any problem why did that problem occur uh, if there's no problem okay that means what we're doing is okay but if problem is occurring in certain you know aspect then there can be a new guideline remember what i mentioned about mhrua you know you can then there can be a guideline try to see where the changes can you know affect to make sure we have effective blood transfusion and this is also my lead me to what we call them i don't have it here what we call cold chain so if you go for interview they say what is cold chain cold chain talks about the temperature maintaining the temperature maybe from the manufacturer to whatever and uh, when that product is being used on, on this occasion red blood cell or platelet or ffp or cryo okay so maintaining its blood temperature, you know, uh, from when it's been produced to when it's been transfused into a patient. Okay. Now, um, to mention this as well, there's something I would like to tell you. If you collect blood as a whole blood, the temperature might be the same. But when you collect blood into different components, you realize the temperature might be different. Okay. For example, red blood cell, you can store it maybe between two to eight degree or two to six degree. Now, when you talk about something like platelet, it has to be do with the room temperature maybe you're looking at something like 20 to 22 degree and of course that of the cryo you're looking at maybe something like minus 30 or minus 20 as the case may be okay so that is why it's very very good then we have mobile application for donor engagement so we also have this automated way of engaging with the donor so these are some of the advancements we have here and of course artificial intelligence which is ai is a ruling thing now even as a lecturer that's what students used to write now fair enough that's okay so this artificial intelligence can actually help for you know blood screening as well and then we also look at genomic editing blood diseases so this can also help to you know uh, edit you know the genetic constitution wherever possible of any disease making sure that that will not necessarily affect that uh, blood product now there's what we call intrauterine blood transfusion intrauterine blood transfusion talks about uh, you know, a baby in the uterus need blood, need red cells to be able to survive. So what happened that if there is hemolysis, time will fail me to explain the background, but if there's any hemolysis or maybe there's anything meaning that the blood in the uterus is not really enough or whatever is not supporting the baby. Now, while the baby is still in the uterus, we can actually transfuse blood. We can actually transfuse the patient while in the uterus, so the baby while still in the uterus, and that is called intrauterine blood transfusion. So um, that is also another technology that is also useful. Now, of course, there's also another technology where when we identify any particular antibody, we can also quantify that antibody. 
in quantification of that very antibody this can be very common in pregnancy for some of you that may be coming for sometimes you get interview questions they may ask you if a woman is pregnant and has whatever anti antibodies what are you going to do you have to quantify it okay so depending on the value that you get you might decide okay um let us you know continue repeating this test or as the case may be if the outcome of that result will determine the approach that the doctor is going to use but what i want to explain is that there's a need to quantify igg antibodies if it is a pregnant woman now we have what we call antigen k negative now this is also another technology where uh, uh should i really say technology this is more of a guideline where we make sure that any woman within childbearing age is given antigen k negative okay remember i've talked about different antigens maybe antigen d antigen k antigen e antigen little c you know many of them do for a and b now who knows why there is a reason why i ask questions whatever is sensitive i want to ask question just to make sure if i give the answer you guys will remember who knows why we would have to give or it is recommended for us to give a pregnant woman uh, or any woman within childbearing age to give them antigen K negative blood anytime they require blood. Who knows why? No, it's okay, that's fine. I'm going to tell you. So now, all the antibodies are going to cause hemolysis. In fact, saying this now, let me say something. When you talk about antibody A, antibody B, or anti antigen A, or antigen B, these are IgM I've mentioned. It. So these IgM antigens or antibodies can cause what to call intravascular hemolysis. What it means that if you make mistake with ABO compatibility, that person may likely to die. But someone may not necessarily, you might be unlucky for someone to die because of IgG antibody or antigen incompatibility. But there's a problem with K. With K, while other, uh, other IgG antigens or antibodies may cause extravascular hemolysis. So I've said the other one causes intravascular. This one causes extravascular hemolysis. But with the IgG, sorry, with the antigen K, if a pregnant woman develops antibody K, if the baby, if that antibody passed to the baby, okay, now there's going to be hemolysis. The problem with the hemolysis it will cause to that baby is that it's going to affect the baby's bone marrow and that may affect the, um, the baby's uh, blood cell production. And that is why we want to avoid it where possible. That's why we constantly give antigen K negative. Now, there's what we call irradiated blood product. Irradiated blood product is where we can pass blood into a radio light, and this radio light will then kill any possible, you know, um, you know, substances, especially when, in fact, when you talk about white blood cells. Remember, when you centrifuge your blood, you have plasma, you have platelet. When you are picking the platelet by your manual techniques, if you are picking platelet, you are likely to touch the white cells. So when we produce platelet, even with the red blood cell, there can be some white blood cell floating there. Are you following? And because of that white cell floating there, especially things like lymphocytes, it is not very good for immunocompromised patients. Because things like lymphocytes, so once an immunocompromised patient receives blood, all of once every blood is transferred, you are likely to, white cell is likely to be introduced. The problem with that is the person has is immunocompromised, that thing will technically cause a problem in future, which I may not have time to explain. But when we talk about a radiated blood product, we now use radio light to kill that cells, you know, to take away that very um, human leukocytic antigen which we call HLA. So once we take care of it that way, the person who is um you know immunocompromised can benefit from that blood product. So this is what I'm trying to talk about human um, leukocytic antigen. And of course if the person is immunocompromised, you know where possible because we may not be able to take away all the leukocytes, what we then do is to do what we call HLA match. We now match it to make sure it's compatible first. Then of course then we'll talk about the antigen whether it is positive or negative. I've mentioned FRSS platelet. And of course, hemoglobin S is for people who are in you know, you know, a sickle cell. Now, another thing I want to explain here is what we call high theta negative. This is another technology that I feel I like here. Remember that someone who is blood group A has antibody B. 
someone who is blood group B has antibody A, right? Um, someone who is blood group A has antibody A and B. It is only blood group A, B that does not have any of this antibody. Therefore, I know we said that blood group O is a universal donor, but that is not really true. Blood group O is only a universal donor on red blood cells. Blood group O is not a universal donor on platelet, is not a universal donor on um, FFP, is not a universal donor on um, cryoprecipitate because it has to do with the plasma. The plasma is where the antibodies are, while the antigen, sorry, the recess is where the antigens are. Okay, so now if that is the case, blood group O is only a universal donor when you talk about red blood cell because it doesn't have antigen A or antigen B. But then blood group AB would there have to be a universal donor when you talk about platelet, FFP, and cryo. And that can alternate. What it means that if blood group O is a universal donor in red cells, it cannot be a universal recipient. But it can then be a universal recipient in FFP, cryo, and platelet. While if blood group AB is a universal donor in FFP, cryo, and platelet, it cannot be a universal recipient there, okay? But it can be a universal recipient in red blood cells. So that's how it works. So with the high theta negative, what we do is that because of the percentage of people that has this blood group AB is not much, then we are stuck. If we want to give platelet or FFP or cry, what are we going to do? Because there's a possibility of not getting, you know, what you are looking for. Then, then we now employ a technology of diluting this antibody. What if that? When we get blood group A platelet, we we'll dilute the antibody B. So when we dilute the antibody B to what you guys call a microbiology MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration. So once we dilute it to the minimum concentration that it cannot cause an effect, we now call it high theta negative. So once any platelet or FFP or cryo is high theta negative, it technically means it now mimic blood group A. Okay, so that's the technology that we use here. There's also what we call blood um, exchange transfusion and plasma exchange transfusion um now let me just show you us about this 3d quickly that should, should be round enough The technology that shows okay how you know these blood vessels can be manufactured artificially uh, for blood transfusion okay now um i'll just show us something here just for example this is actually where i would like you guys to pay attention who can tell me what this blood group is just type it on the chart this is not a technical example i finished the presentation i just want to show you guys how things work here and then that is it does anyone know the blood group of this patient Right, when the cells are down, it's negative. When the cells are up, it's positive, okay? So basically, if, if, if I want you to look at this as your tie group. Just forget about the control. Control should be negative. So what you need to ask yourself, so if I do tie grouping and there's no reaction in A, there's no reaction in B, but there's reaction in D, what blood group do you call it? It's O, right? And that, now if you look at the reverse group, it's confirmed because it has antibody A and B, okay? Now, there's another thing I want to show us here. This is very, very important. If you look at it, this is what we call ABO compatibility. Because of our time, I'm going to just go ahead and explain this. When you see, they can see that the cells is up. There's cells up here. Yeah? There's also cells down. That means it's negative and it's also positive. This can happen. This is what we call dual population. D-U-A-L population. So dual population. So once you have a dual population, it means that this patient has been exposed to another blood group that is not its own let me explain it like this so if someone is blood group o negative and you give the person blood group o positive because you've exposed the person to d antigen not on this occasion okay because you've exposed the person with d antigen what the person is going to have dual population d antigen negative of the patient and d antigen positive of that blood that that person received now if you look at this one you're going to see the dual population here means that this person may be okay has been received a blood that is either b positive 
or be negative dependent okay but because you can see when this the cell that is down here means that the person doesn't have the d uh, sorry so this person have received a blood that is either b positive or b negative so the cell that is that means is b for it b negative but the cell that is high here means that it is what b positive i don't need that makes sense okay now because the d antigen here the d antigen means the positive or negative now let's forget about the one that is off if we go by this and forget about the reverse if you go by this you say that this person has is what b positive if you forget about the off one sorry if you if you if you forget about the the down one sorry you say that this person is b positive okay but because of this down one it means that this person have received another type of blood now i presented this because this is a case of transfusion reaction this person is actually a positive sorry uh, o positive is this patient here and they gave this person b positive blood are you following and that is why you're having this dual population here okay so that is what we mean by drop of pleasure so if you go for interview here and they show you this kind of thing think about you know um discrepancy maybe someone who have been transfused in the past but the common one they're going to give you may not be in a case of transition reaction it might be in a case where someone is blood group o negative and the person receive o positive does that make sense okay so that is what they are likely to give you here now let me also say this quickly this is a guideline that shows you um what we do here so if we do a blood group and we notice blood group and antibody screening and the and the the d reaction is weak we cannot decide is it partial d or weak d like i've explained so if we now determine that is how we can now go so once we look at the result you now say is the reaction great with one or more anti d reaction positive but weak if it is weak if the answer is yes the next question you ask yourself what is the age of the woman if the woman is less than or equal to 50 years so if it is no if it is not this age if it is no you don't need to worry because what you mean that the person is not is possibly not going to give birth okay so you are not worried about it we are worried about weak d and partial d in a case of pregnancy but if the answer is yes we then need to investigate it further to make sure that the person is either weak d or partial d now what we do is that if the result come back and say is a partial d we we'll treat the person as negative not positive does that make sense okay now, um, this is talked about what we call enzyme panel. It's another technology where we identify antibodies using what we call enzyme panel. Um, enzyme panel means that they are treated with enzyme, okay? So it can help to be able to identify certain kind of antibodies. So I'm going to show you the antibody panel, but what I'm trying to show you here is that there are some anti antigens or antibody that can be destroyed by enzyme. So those antigens or antibodies that can be destroyed by enzyme are uh, what we call um, this MNS and FY. FYA and F. So these ones can be destroyed by enzyme panel. That's enzyme treated, but it can enhance this. So enzyme panel or enzyme treated panel can either enhance certain antibodies or destroy certain antibodies. In destroying antibodies, these are the ones it will destroy. To enhance, these are the ones it will enhance. This help us for confirmation of any of the antibodies we get. And this, there's also another thing we call dosage effect. You know about the competition of different, the same or different antibody, from, uh, you know, competing to a binding site. So that is called a dosage effect. We also consider that in a case of uh, blood uh, antibody identification. Because of our time, I'm not going to spend more time on that. Now, let me give you this example. So this is gene. This is the antigen. So this is JKA. Because it is only JKA, you can see that's the, the color. You can see. It. So they have. Easily, they can easily bind. So in this situation, you're going to get a strong reaction because there's no competition here. But look at here, you have blue and, purple and pink, I think so. Now, when you look at this, you're going to see that it's JKA and JKB. Because of this, the same family, okay? But there's a difference because one is A, the other one is B. There can be competition. Now, this competition can lead to either weak reaction or in some cases, it might be negative. And that is why it's also important you, you consider that in your antibody identification. And of course, this is also on the JKB as well. Now, that means that this can give you the strength of the reaction. Where there is a competition, like I've just shown you now, you might get plus one or you might even get negative. So you need to be careful that it's negative. You need to work out, you know, what is happening. Is it homozygous antibody or heterozygous, which I may not be able to explain more. But where it is homozygous antibody, you are going to get a strong reaction okay now let me show you um let me show you this antibody 
panel okay so i'm just gonna make this quick so this is the result so you've done the antibody screening is positive you now need to know the antibody panel what is the exact antibody that this person has got so this is a reaction this is a reaction this is the result you got from the question so if the manufacturer has given you cell one look at the cell here cell one cell two cell three cell four up to ten okay i may not be able to have time to explain this r1 r1 i have videos on all of this okay so but this is the reaction so what you are trying to do here is to see look at m has this is a reaction pattern of m this is a reaction pattern of n this is a reaction pattern of s so these are different igg antigen i was talking about by the way so these are they are different reaction pattern so you are trying to find out which of the which of this reaction pattern matches this patient's result Anyone that matches it is the antibody that patient has got. Because of our time, I'm just going to go quickly to show you the answer. So this person has got antibody FYA. So if you look at the reaction pattern, on cell one is zero, zero, plus four means one, two, three, four, as the case may be five. Even weak is also positive. So positive, positive, negative, 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 positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, 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 then negative, negative. That is how you can say this person has antibody Dufi A and B. Now, sorry, Dufi A. Now, because of our time, I may not be able to explain this much, but there is what we call dosage the effect, like I've explained. We need to consider that. That to explain why we cross this off here. So, but I may not be able to explain that, but let me show you something, just to give you a hint. So, when we talk about the group, big K and small K, they are in one group. LUEA and LUB, one group. FYA, FYB, one group. JK, JKB, one group. Now, M and N, one group. That's the only one that is confused. M and N, because it's a different letter. But big S and small S, one group. Now, what you want to do is this. The homozygous, now we cross it where, where it is homozygous, positive, and the result is negative, is where you're supposed to exclude that is not that antibody. Okay? So if you look at this M and S, big s sorry s this s and s so big s is negative but small s is positive what it means on cell one small s is homozygous i just want to give us an example but assuming that it is positive here as well assuming this is positive what it means that it will be heterozygous so what we are saying the rules say that if it is heterozygous positive here even if it is negative here because of the tendency of weak reaction or negative you don't exclude it where it is heterozygous positive, even though the result is negative. Now, the rule says if the reaction is positive and the patient result is negative, exclude that antibody. But you can't exclude it if it is heterozygous positive. Now, these just other techniques like elution techniques where we think there's a kind of um, complement or any auto antibody that may be interfering with the result we can use elution technique to remove those antibodies then that way we can be able to get the result we want to get remember somebody mentioned about um, medicine affecting the blood group yes when that happens we can use some of these techniques to be able to remove that interference that way it can help us to um get the result we want so blood transfusion like i've explained you know is important then the testing in blood bank abo you know antibody clahawas phenotyping and all of that then we use automation of course there are requirements okay like treated like irradiated blood some patients need irradiated blood if they are immunocompromised patients some people require um hla match and so on and of course i've mentioned something like high theta negative and there are guidelines that that is guiding the blood bank like okay i've mentioned current group history group and uh, i've mentioned something about why we give a pregnant woman antigen k negative these are all guidelines there's a number of guidelines and i have videos on all of that anyway thank you so much for listening i don't want to take us more i don't know if there's any question thank you thank you so much this has been a very extensive cover of this topic i know if you have more time you would have still said much more um a lot of time has already been spent so let's quickly look at um, if we have any just a few questions uh, so please you can drop your questions i know some people drop questions at the very beginning and they are far away now but 
Yes, there's a lot of positive uh, reviews too. This is mind blowing, uh, wonderful presentation, and all that. So yes. we can have your questions even. Um, Obina, can I also say if they think that the time is an issue, what we can do is, um, I think many of them, if they get me on LinkedIn and they say, oh, I participated in this meeting, um, please, I have this question, I'm not happy to answer it if nobody wants to ask, ask the question here anyway. Right, right. So I guess we, I guess we heard that. So Emmanuel is on LinkedIn. Um, you can get him on LinkedIn, Dr. Emmanuel. Ubudu, so you can get him on LinkedIn and then perhaps ask your questions there. Um, okay, I've not seen any question here. The only one here is if blood components separated, can it affect the lifespan of the blood? That's one of the only questions here. If blood components is separated, can it, uh, can it affect the lifespan of the blood? Not really. Just one minute. Another thing I try to do with you guys is that I, I'll pop on, on a chart. I should actually say, um, um, YouTube, just one minute, YouTube channel. I just want to make sure some of the things I've said, um, if you can actually go on my YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of things that, and that will really help you a lot. That will really help you a lot. Okay. Anyway, so Bina, you were asking a question, sorry, I didn't get that. Okay, so somebody was, yeah, I think you answered that already. If, uh... If blood component when separated can affect the lifespan of the blood. Okay, okay, I think it depends on how you look at it. The answer is yes, isn't it? Because if you the red blood cell lifespan in terms of maybe I don't know um how would I put it. Um technically your blood is supposed to be 120 days, but uh, once it's collected in a bag, it has a, a certain kind of life, you know, a uh, shelf life, okay? But you can see that the variation of the shelf life is dependent on the component. Something like platelet it for five days, okay? Something like uh, red cells can take a little bit longer. Something like FFP and cry can take some years to be able to expand. Yes, if it, if it is types of um, life shelf, the different components have different life shelf. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I've already, sorry, uh, someone was asking me something. I've already put my YouTube channel, they just called Two Good BMS, I think so, sometimes I forget. Two Good BMS Jobs, okay, so it's my YouTube channel. Just, if you search it, yeah, you will definitely you will see a lot of this information and then that should be okay. All right, any other question? Uh, Mr. Ali, your question is not clear. Why is it just for five years? Yeah, I think, I, think, I, think, I think I understand. He's asking about she's asking about platelet, isn't it? Why is it not, why is it just five days, isn't it? I think that's what the question is. Yes, that's what the question is. So it's because you know the nature of the platelet, it can easily denature. Remember, it's a protein. Remember, in fact, let me even say this: when we collect platelet, when we collect platelet, we need to put platelet in agitator. If we don't agitate platelet, if we don't continue mixing the platelet, you know, um, in the agitator, what is going to happen? It will be activated and it will form a clot. It will clot basically. Okay. Now that is why it needs to be agitated, and because of the is a protein and is likely to denature under that room temperature, you can't really keep it for a long time. Okay, I hope I've answered that question. And there's a question I would have said, um, yes, 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 yes. Hey, dear, that's, um, that, that, that is actually the main cause of it. And of course, sorry, one minute. Can this antigen K negative be used to? Uh, it depends on how you want to answer that question. So we give antigen K negative to prevent the possibility of that HDN. Okay, that's, the, that's to prevent it. But it doesn't entirely preserve, prevent it because even if you avoid antigen K, anti D can also do the same thing. And the only thing is that we want to affect um, head DN caused by antigen K because of the possibility of affecting the bone marrow of the baby. I was going to say something um, quickly from what somebody just asked. Maybe what I should actually expect you guys to ask me is why are we talking about antibodies on platelet? Platelet is just a thrombocyte. We shouldn't really be talking about antibodies on platelet. We shouldn't be worried about it. We shouldn't be worried about antibody A, antibody B. We shouldn't because it's a cell. If we can't worry about if the antibody is on, should be in the plasma, not on the cell. What's supposed to be on the cell is antigen, not antibody. So why if platelet, which is a thrombocyte, is a cell, 
why are we worried about anti A or anti B leading to maybe high theta negative as the case may be? Now, the answer to that is that because of the, it's just because of the question someone asked that reminded me this. So, because of the nature of the platelet, it can easily deteriorate, it can easily be activated. So, what we do is to mix it with plasma. So we talk about your plasma, you know, you mix it with plasma with the platelet. That can help the agitation so it can be flowing because you cannot agitate a cell. You need that liquid portion of the blood to help you to be agitating the cell and so on. So that's actually, because of that plasma will add to it, that's why we now talk about, um, you know, the antibody. Apart from it, we shouldn't really be talking about that. There are so many things I want to say now, but time wouldn't let me to say that um somebody has said is i'm not sure if i've if i've lost a track oh bina can you tell i think the question is going up up i'm missing some of them so i don't want to read some and leave some thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you for the compliment i think there, there are some questions i missed while i was talking and <laughs> Yeah. So one just said, is it possible to get panel of cells commercially? Um, yeah, the cells are commercially prepared. The antibody cells are commercially, you know, the antibody panel cells, they are commercially prepared. Okay. If you buy it and buy IgG card, it's something that people can actually do in Nigeria. You can do it manually. You don't necessarily need um, the automation. Even this IgG card and um, even the ABO card group, if you buy the card, you can actually do it you know manually that thing analyzer can do you can do it all you need to do is just dilute the cells put you know make the opening put the you can peel it off you don't need to make opening like another just peel it off it will be open just add whatever you want to add put it in your incubator centrifuge it it will give you the answer okay well thank you dr Imano. okay so let me just take this last one please sir how do we get screening cells r1 r1 and r2 like I said, if you mean how to get it, like buy it, it's commercially done. Okay. Right. So we would want to draw the cutting here. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, I, I, I know that um, there's much uh, more. Uh, just open, open, let me ask, there's a question that came, I think is an interesting question. How can cryoprecipitate be extracted? This is very, very important question, okay? Even though I may not give you details because of our time. But I want you to know that for clots to form, fibrinogen needs to be converted to fibrin. So what happens is that when the plasma, in that plasma, there are clotting factors in which fibrinogen is one of the clotting factors. So what is going to happen is that what they will do, once they remove a lot of the plasma, okay, or they will just put the plasma in a freezer, a more lower temperature, now, if you, if you look at blood when it's the lowest, you're going to see white tissue substances. That white tissue substances you are seeing, they are, cry, they are uh, fibrinogen. So, because that white tissue substance is not, you know, like when you have uh, a proteinous substance like a milk, I'm not sure how to explain, you see some white tissue substance sedimenting at the bottom. That is, in terms of plasma, that would be fibrinogen. Okay? So, what they will now do, they will now remove the plasma and leave that bottom part. You see, now they remove the majority of the plasma and leave less plasma with more of that bottom part, which is now the fibrinogen, and that is now called cryopressive. All right, okay, that's fine. Obina, go on. I think that's where I'm going to draw the cut. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So, I think some of the questions will still be trapped from Zoom, and we can still um, share them with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bozo. This has been a very great time, and thank you our participants for being patient with us all through this learning period. Um, uh, be sure that you're going to get the recordings, you're going to get the slides of the Buddha World Christian Station with us, and then you will get the certificate of um, attendance and participation for this webinar. Thank you so very much. Do have a very good night, rest everybody. Thank you, Delphi. All right, thank you all so much. Good night. Bye.